Welcome to Wellness Wednesday. I hope everyone is doing really well today. I'm going to give it just a minute for everyone to pop on. Let's see. Make sure we're, oh, it looks like I'm live now. So awesome. So I'm going to give it just a second now for everyone to pop on. Um, sometimes I like to use uh, StreamYard and StreamYard will actually let me like run a 30 second timer. So it like counts down so that you can jump on and see. Um, so, okay, today we're talking about gallbladders, okay? Gallbladders, so much fun, right? Well, I would love to know in the comments if you still have your gallbladder, and if you still have your gallbladder, um, then if you're having gallbladder troubles, or you think you might be, um, so drop that in the comments below. What we're gonna talk about today is if you can save your gallbladder, if you should get rid of that thing, um, and, Facebook is telling me again to set my frame rate. I don't have that setting ability. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah, it says right here, Facebook sets that automatically. So I don't know what you're talking about, Facebook. All right, we're gonna roll with it anyways. And uh, if it doesn't work, I'll turn this into a podcast episode and we'll do it that way. Um, so gallbladder surgery is also called a cholecystectomy um, it is so unbelievably common so unbelievably common almost a million people get their gallbladder removed every single year but that begs the question is it necessary okay so if you look at the numbers the national institute of health says that only one percent of gallstones become a problem every year and about 80 percent of patients never develop the acute emergent symptoms from their gallstones. So what that means is even if you've been diagnosed with gallstones, there is an 80% chance or better that you don't need your gallbladder removed. Now, if I will tell you this, um, if you go to a surgeon, they're gonna recommend surgery, period. That's what they do. That is their intervention, right? Um, but the more interesting fact is people assume that if you get your gallbladder removed, that you're healed, that it works. Um, and that's not always the case. There are plenty of people that have a number of different problems with gallbladders, even if they've had it removed. They still have the symptoms and the problems because guess what they did not do? They did not address the root cause. Um, and sometimes people have gallbladder symptoms so much that you would swear from a clinical standpoint that they still have a gallbladder, um, but they don't. There's actually um, something that there, who was it? Dr. Richard Lipton, um, he put out a bunch of information on, and he's an MD, uh, on how uh, when you remove something from the body, be it a gallbladder, an appendix, or a finger, appendage, um, then you the energetic imprint is still there and so just like an amputee can have phantom pains you can still have phantom issues from your gallbladder hi lori good morning good morning um so if i'm just popping into your news fees if you somebody invited you to the wellness circle and you don't know why the heck you're here i'm audrey christie i'm a functional and integrative nurse nutritionist and energy medicine practitioner um, i help women heal from autoimmune disease chronic illness from those symptoms that just won't flip and go away right um, so i help you discover and find your root causes and get rid of them so like i said um, i think i said that in here this is a uh, requested topic. Um, so that's why we're going to talk about it. So a lot of times when we have gallbladder issues, even in like the functional integrative naturopath space that I practice in, a lot of times there's still misdiagnoses. Um, people want, well, one <laughs> naturopath can't really diagnose things. Um, but a lot of times people are led down the wrong path as to what could be happening with their gallbladder. Sometimes it's even gone as far as somebody on their on the road to almost having a total hip replacement and then figuring out after they started doing the cleansing and clearing work that it wasn't actually their hip to begin with. It was referred pain from their low back that was referred from their gallbladder. Um, I've seen people go in for chest pains, um, thinking they're having a heart attack and it was their gallbladder. It was actually a gallbladder attack because that refers the pain. Anytime that stuff happens, the automatic conventional medicine um, opportunity or, or choice, right, is to get rid of that thing, get rid of that gallbladder. And so that begs the question, do we need our gallbladder, right? And I hear this a lot with appendix too. Do we need our appendix? And the answer to both of those, by the way, is yes, we need those. We need our tonsils and adenoids. I can almost chart the exact path 
that happens to somebody when they remove tonsils and adenoids as a child or adult, what happens next, right? Because we're not addressing that root cause. It's the same for an appendix. Uh, and it's the same for a gallbladder. Now I get it. If you've already had your gallbladder removed and you can't put it back, right? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, the information that I'm going to give you, if you're having the symptoms of the gallbladder issues, then you still need to do, it is basically the same thing. Now, gallbladder issues, just like anything else, is a tree with many roots, right? And so the big thing you want to do is get to that root cause. Um, the reason why we need our gallbladder is because it acts as a storage tank for something called bile. Um, and bile helps to digest fats and fat-soluble vitamins. But it also serves a lot of really important functions related to insulin, so blood sugar, related to our hormones, and related to the detoxification process that our liver does, right? So when we look at fat-soluble vitamins, which ones are fat-soluble? Vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, those are all fat-soluble vitamins. Um, if you know, you know, I, I harp on the benefits of vitamin D all the time. Vitamin A and vitamin D are both very beneficial for the immune system. Vitamin E is critical for female hormone production, fertility, um, and it, it is an opposing force for estrogen dominance and all the things that come with that. So from that standpoint alone, if you just consider those four fat-soluble vitamins, then you can see how removing the gallbladder alters a lot of critical processes in the body, right? Let me peek in and see who's hanging out with me this morning. Good morning, Holly, or Holly, Maria, <laughs> Maria Holly. Um, I should have said Miss Holly. <laughs> Good morning. Um, okay, so we're talking about gallbladder and we're talking about gallbladder and hormones right now if you have just joined us. So when hormones are out of balance, they have a huge impact on the gallbladder, okay? So gallstones happen more frequently in women and in men um, for the reason that estrogen causes an increased amount of bile release from the gallbladder. So high estrogen or estrogen dominance, which happens in men and women, um, it increases the amount of cholesterol in the bile and it decreases the amount of bile salts. Okay. And then you have increased progesterone or a progesterone imbalance that actually leads to the contraction of the gallbladder, right? So if you have a decreased ability to release bile, if you have a decreased ability, a decreased bile salts and increased thickeners or cholesterol in that, um, in the gallbladder, and then it's contracted, then guess what? <laughs> that doesn't make for a very easy way for all of the, for the, for the gallbladder to empty, for bile to continually circle or cycle through there. And so that's why it's really common to get cholecystitis or inflamed gallbladder um, around pregnancy or right after pregnancy because your hormones are um, increasing and de decreasing dramatically. Now, if you are taking any kind of hormone replacement therapy, then that can also lead to gallbladder issues. Um, so it, it, hormone replacement therapy really, really alters your digestion. And so your gallbladder may stop responding to the food you eat, um, depending on when you took your last dose of hormones. And I know a lot of people swear by those things and they don't want to give them up, but it's really best if you can. Um, low thyroid function also slows down gallbladder function, specifically T4. It stimulates the gallbladder to relax um, and release bile into the, the digestive tract. Okay. So thyroid function, of course, is also impacted by estrogen dominance, right? So at the same time you address gallbladder, you also have to be looking at your thyroid function or at least checking on it. It's an absolute must do. See, Maria says my cholesterol is a little high, so we may have to do a class on that too. Okay. <laughs> we can talk about cholesterol too. We'll do that on, I'll, I'll put that for upcoming ideas. Um, so now those are like some of the big gallbladder destroyer, destroyers, but let's look at some that are sometimes more common that are more uh, insidious, like alcohol, like plastics, like makeup, the hormones and chemicals in makeup, caffeine, heavy metals. Um, I just taught a class in the membership on uh, heavy metals 
uh, this morning actually and gave all the recipes and the supplement protocol and all that stuff to detox heavy metals. Well, a lot of times heavy metals and gallbladders go hand in gallbladder issues go hand in hand. Stress because of the increased adrenaline and cortisol. And then MSGs and GMOs in man-made food products are also a problem for gallbladders. Now, when you have gallbladder issues, there are a couple of things. Actually, let me go through some risk factors with y'all first. So um, other risk factors. So I gave you some of the, some of the things that can be an issue. So alcohol, um, plastics, makeup, all that stuff. Let's talk about heavy metals. Let's talk about some of the risk factors. So some of the common risk factors that are seen with gallbladders, gallstones, gall, gallbladder disease, if you will, cholecystitis, um, is leaky gut, right? Bile is transported in the gut. And so when that is impaired, bile is impaired through that inflammation cascade and it increases and makes leaky gut worse. It allows microbes to leak into the blood and that further impairs the release of the bile. Um, another risk factor is what, what is called a Western diet. And it's interesting. So in my um, thesis paper that I wrote, I talked about the, uh, why it's called the Western diet. And it's called the Western diet because the West, these uh, industrialized countries are the only ones where fat and sugar is added to foods. So if you go to certain other countries, less industrialized countries or countries with better food regulation than the U.S., um, a potato, you know, people just eat potatoes. They wouldn't take a potato chip, fry it in oil, and then add oil and salts and sugars to make sure that it stayed in a package for a long time. I'll get more into that um, coming up soon once my uh, paper is approved, once I argue my thesis and it's approved, but we'll go, we'll go through that um, later. Another risk factor is insufficient methylation. So depending on which genes you have turned on and turned off, if, you're, if you have an increase or decreased ability to methylate, um, B vitamins to methylate and clear estrogens, that can be a big risk factor for having these issues. Um, eating gluten, gluten and other gluten-like grains, gluten-like substances impair the gut wall, right? They tear open the tight junctions and they allow proteins and all kinds of things. It basically impedes or, or compromises, tears a hole in the blood biliary barrier. That's a mouth, mouthful, blood biliary. <laughs> See, I can't do it twice. I got it out once. I'm not going to get it out twice. <laughs> um, again, estrogen dominance, increased cholesterol, um, obesity, high triglycerides, pregnancy, hormone replacement therapy, whether that is for perimenopausal type stuff or birth control pills or um, anything birth control related, diabetes or other metabolic issues, that's a big risk factor. Crohn's disease, again, that kind of relates to gluten, but that gluten issue is a thing for everyone. Um, and then rapid weight loss is also an issue for the gallbladder. So if you have rapidly lost weight um, faster than what your body was ready to release weight, then that can, can cause an issue. On that same token, so can weight cycling. Um, and so up and down, right? If you gain 20, lose 20. Gain 40, lose 20. Um, and then prolonged or long-term fat-restricted diets. Now, you don't need to eat 70% fat of your meal, right? You don't, macros, your fat shouldn't be the highest thing, but also reducing it down to lower than what it's supposed to be can cause um, big issues as well. All right, so let me pop in. Everybody's still hanging out down there. Y'all let me know if you have questions. Okay, so now to the two pathways, right? Neither of them are wrong, but in my clinical opinion, my clinical experience, you gotta do both, okay? So there are gallbladder flushes that you can do, and we'll talk about how to do one of those here in a minute. Um, but you have to understand that, that a gallbladder flush if you're still doing all those things that we've just talked about, if all those things are still a problem, then a gallbladder flush, even though it is less permanent than the Band-Aid of having your gallbladder removed, and even though it is less permanent than, uh, you know, or even though it is a more natural Band-Aid than taking medication or other conventional things, it's still just a Band-Aid. If you're not treating the root cause, flushing your gallbladder is still just a temporary fix. You're temporarily covering up that problem um, and hoping it'll go away, but it's not gonna, it's gonna come back. So um, there's a couple things that you can do. If you're gonna do it on your own, then I suggest 
adding water, lemon, and beet juice. Mix it all together. Drink that twice a day, um, eight ounces twice a day. Um, and adding the herb schizandria. Schizandria has a bunch of benefits for mental health capacity, so anxiety and depression and all those things, but it's also really great for gallbladder cleansing. Um, and then if that isn't enough, then you can do a more conventional, natural flush detox. Sometimes those um, include enemas as well. But please know that that is not a rational way <laughs> to heal this. It's just, it's part of healing it, right? But doing that alone, putting that in a box and saying, this is what I'm going to do, period, is not going to cause the problem. You have to treat the root, not the gallbladder. So before we go into more details on a gallbladder flush or cleanse, if you will, then know that you have to address the root problems to get it to go away all together. So if your root cause is heavy metals, then that has to be addressed. Okay. If you are on hormone replacement therapy and estrogen is creating problems or estrogen is just, you know, estrogen dominance is creating problems, then that has to be addressed. Okay. If you have a fungal infection or candida or mold toxicity, and that's leading to elevated ammonia, then ammonia and fungus and candida has to be addressed. Okay. So you really have to take a root level approach to make sure that you get lasting results rather than a temporary band-aid, temporary relief. All right, are we following? I'm getting excited about it. So, <laughs> so sometimes I get excited, I start talking fast and I jump back into all the scientific terms and everybody's going, what is happening? <laughs> okay, so a, a, a traditional liver and gall bladder cleanse is seven days. It takes seven days to do it. Um, days one through six are preparation days with clean eating and some specific dietary recommendations. Day six is a prep day. And then day seven is, well, day six morning is a prep day. Day six evening is the actual cleanse. Um, and then the following morning, you have a little bit of follow-up to do, right? So we're talking seven days. Um, days one through six you're going to take a little malic acid in a glass of water and you're gonna drink that before meals, okay? You wanna make sure that you get all of your water every day. You're gonna avoid cold foods or chilled foods. So you wanna eat room uh, temperature or warm foods. You want to avoid animal products, dairy and fried products. Um, and you, if you have to have animal protein, then you're gonna to wanna to make sure it's a really lean chicken or um, fish, basically. No, no red meat or no pork. Um, you want to avoid any unnecessary medications, supplements, or vitamins. Um, and then sort of like a bonus is if you did a, an enema before this and after this, like just a plain water enema. That part is optional. Usually people go, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and that's okay. You might not have to. Okay. Um, especially if your, your detox pathways are really, really moving well. Um, and then on day six, you're going to do that for days one through six. Then on day six, um, you're going to drink 32 ounces of water with malic acid in the morning. You can eat a light breakfast, like a light gluten-free oatmeal. Um, you want to avoid sugar, spices, of course, avoid dairy, milk, butter, yogurt, cheese, oil, ham, eggs, nuts, pastries, cold cereals, etc. cetera. Um, fruits like berries and bananas are allowed. Then you can have lunch. You want to eat really plain and bland. And this is intentional. Remember, it's not forever. This is just for, for this specific issue. So you're going to eat really plain cook really plainly cooked or steamed veggies. Um, you can add, you can have that with white rice that has been rinsed three to four times and then cooked. Um, and you can add with some sea salt, but no protein foods, no butter or no oil. And then you're going to stop eating and drinking at 1.30. So you're going to be MPO, nothing to eat or drink after 1.30. That evening around 6 p.m., right? You're going to add four tablespoons of Epsom salt to 24 ounces of really good filtered water. Um, and it makes four six ounce servings, 24 ounces divided by four is four six ounce servings. You're going to drink three quarters of a glass. Then you can always add lemon if the taste is too bad for you. Um, and you can also use a, a straw to bypass your taste buds. Okay. Um, and then brush your teeth afterwards. That'll help get rid of it. Right. Um, so at six, you drink your first serving eight, you drink your second serving nine 30, 
Um, if you haven't had a bowel movement, then that's when you might want to step in with the enema. At 9.45, you're going to drink grapefruit juice with three quarters of, with another um, serving of your Epsom salt mixture. Um, and you're going to pour the juice over half a cup of cold pressed olive oil into a jar. And then you're going to shake that jar up until it's super watery. Okay. Super watery. Um, and this, this part can be gross. Shake it up till it's soup. So you've got half a cup of cold pressed olive oil and the juice of your grapefruits. You're going to shake them up until that's watery. And then you're going to stand next to your bed. You want to, you want to stand, not sit down to drink this stand, chug it as fast as possible. It's only half a cup. So you should be able to get it down really quickly. Um, whatever you do, don't take down, take more than five minutes to get it down. Okay. And then lie down immediately, lie flat on your back with one to two pillows, propping your head up. Um, or you can lay on your right side and pull your knees towards your chest and you want to lay perfectly still for 20 minutes and fall asleep if you can. Now, if you feel the urge to get up and go potty in the middle of the night, like have a bowel movement, then please do so. The next morning, you're going to get up and drink that last glass of Epsom salt mix, right? If you're thirsty, when you wake up, you can drink a glass of warm, plain water, room temperature, plain water. Um, and then go sit down, read, rest, meditate. Okay. Um, at eight, you're going to have another glass of your Epsom salt mixture. And then once you get to about 10 AM, you can start having fresh pressed juices. You can have, um, some fresh fruit, and then you can gradually work your way up to eating more and more food. So then after that, you might want to eat some more fruit, um, or add some rice and veggies. And then by the next day, you can go back to eating normally. You do want to continue to eat kind of light, gentle meals for two to three days, um, making sure that it is gluten-free and dairy-free. Okay. Now that's a lot, right? That is a ton to do. So that's why usually I work through people with that one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> so, so if that seems intimidating to you, if that seems intimidating to you, then what I would recommend is starting with beet juice, lemon, uh, beet and lemon in warm water, beet juice and lemon in warm water, just adding that every single day, making sure that you are using some sort of digestive enzymes with your foods that helps to break down fat, um, so that you can begin that process and see if that helps. Um, most of the time in those bowel movements, people see actual gallstones or bile stones in their bowel movements. Now there is a, a information on the internet that says that that is not um, bile or or gallstones in your bowel movements when you do a gallbladder cleanse like I just described right but <laughs> but here's the thing um, and I've never tested them so they could absolutely be right the theory is that it is just the olive oil right mixed with the mixed with the citrus fruit and it comes out in those hard little pebbles however I've had people do this cleanse once a month for three and four months in a row. And the first time they'll have 120 stones in their, in their bowel movement. And then the next time they'll have 75 and the next time they'll have 30 and then the next time they'll have 25. And so my pushback on that theory that it's not, that it doesn't really work is that one people get better. And two, if they're drinking the same amount of the stuff, then they should have the same amount of the stuff in their, in their bowels, bowel movements every time. So Let's see. I see Tara. Hi, Tara. Uh, Tara says, I'm guessing I can't work out while doing this cleanse. No, I wouldn't. You can do gentle movement, gentle walking, gentle yoga, but I would not suggest anything more than that um, during this cleanse. So going for a, a, a gentle walk, and that's going to be different for everyone. So if you're somebody that runs five miles a day, then maybe you could go for a one to three mile jog and be okay. Um, but you don't want to do anything that is pushing yourself. Um, and you want to make sure that you need the gallbladder cleanse, right? If you, if you don't have the signs and symptoms, um, that, that I mentioned, if you're not having gallbladder issues, gallbladder pain, uh, then it's a really in-depth type of cleanse to, to just jump into just because you might need it, just because you think, think you might need it. Okay. All right. So that was a lot of information and I'm certain that you will have questions. So if you have questions now, or if you come back, um, with questions 
you know, if you think about it for a little while and you're like, wow, I really, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to do that or what I need to do next, then definitely let me know. I'm here to answer your questions. I'm here to help. Um, and I hope that you guys have an awesome day. Uh, and if you are in the Root Cause Revolution membership, then head to the membership portal and check out that replay video so that you can see the heavy metal detox as well. Tara says, oh, okay, my, my fault for coming in late. Yeah, no worries, girl. No worries. This is for gallbladders. Gallbladder, if you have gallstones. Um, but no worries. I'm glad you came in. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I'm here for questions. Be well.